Today I'd like to talk to you about the Havamel versus the Holy Bible. I'm going to be comparing the two and showing that there's actually quite a few similarities between the two and it uh, should be an interesting study. Uh, interestingly, I just saw a moose right over here. Hopefully he won't uh, mistake my sheepskin here for uh, the hide of another moose. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. Just have to keep an eye out behind me here. He just walked right over here, about 30 yards away. But uh, the, what's the purpose of this study? Well, the purpose of this study, a lot of people that are into the Viking movement and, and uh, would consider themselves heathen would reject the Bible because of, uh, for a number of reasons, the fact that the Catholic Church claims to use it, claims it as an authority, the sacred scriptures. They don't really. They don't really believe in the sacred scriptures. This branch has to go. A little pruning there. <laughs> Not going to have that poking me in the head the whole time. But, um, but when you actually study the scriptures for yourself, the Holy Word of God, um, you'll see that it actually lines up in many places with the Havamal. Now, if you don't understand the history of the Havamal, this here, um, Basically, it, it comes from the Codex Regius, which was written around 1270 or so. Um, and, you know, they say, well, there, it could be that it was just translated from an older source or, or whatever else. It's basically the sayings of Odin, sayings of the High One. And uh, some suggest that maybe this uh, Snorri um, Sturlson, I think his name was, they suggest that maybe he was the writer of it in actuality and that he tried to line it up with the Bible and kind of use it as a way to evangelize the heathen that weren't coming over to Catholicism. And um, so there's there's a lot of debate there as to the real source of it. Was it something more ancient that he translated? Was it something he wrote completely himself or other people wrote completely themselves and they compared it to the scriptures? I don't really know. Um, but I know what the the history of this book is. This book is a lot more ancient than the Havamal. Um, a lot more ancient. Uh, this King James Bible was, was translated from 1604 to 1611 from Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. They also used a lot of different translations, foreign language translations that were more ancient than the King James. Um, there are thousands upon thousands of extant manuscripts, Greek and Hebrew as well. Um, a lot of sources, and they date back a long time ago. So, um, the history of the, the Havamal, sketchy at best, and uh, I will be using, by the way, this one here, um, the As a True community puts this thing out right here, and I will be using this. I'll be reading from the, they have basically the original, um, you know, Nordic, like the Norse language there, and then they have the Olive Bray translation, and then sort of a modern translation that they did for themselves. Um, you know, that they themselves did, I'll say it that way. But the Olive Bray translation was done in 1908. So this King James Bible right here came out in 1611 and went through a number of revisions as the English language itself was being, you know, updated and changed and whatever else in terms of spelling and, and font and everything. Because back when it was first published, it was in a Gothic font. Um, you can see that with the 1611. And then as it changed, it changed to a more of a Roman font that we're used to today. Reading today, a lot of the spelling changes and whatever else. But the King James Bible, all the revisions were done by 1769. And uh, so that's what I'm using. So this King James Bible is a much more ancient text than the Havamal. There's no question about that. And if you say, well, I don't believe that. I think the Havamal is actually older and the, and the Bible copied it. Well, you're going to have a difficult time proving that. Right. And again, this is not meant to be some kind of a um, putting down anybody for having, you know, uh, Viking ancestry or whatever else. Not at all. Um, I'm trying to help you to see that the Bible is actually not that contrary to what you might believe. So let's begin here. Havamel 2. Hail ye givers, a guest is come. Say, where shall he sit within? Much pressed is he who fain on the hearth would seek for warmth and wheel. All right, that's the Havamel. Now let's look at what the Bible says. James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. 
For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, gay meaning happy, of course, in the older English there, more proper, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So, some similarity there, you know. Um, somebody comes and, and they need warmth and whatever else, and you should give that to them, be hospitable. Well, that's a good trait, whether you believe in the Havamel or the, the Holy Scriptures. That's a good thing to do, to be hospitable to somebody. But what the Bible is saying is, if that person that comes in there, you have one guy who's rich and one guy who's poor, don't show respect of persons. Don't say to the rich guy, oh, sit over here in the best place, and to the poor, you, you know, sit over there, where, you know, you won't bother anybody. Now, if you're a heathen, why would you reject that advice from the Bible? It's very close to what the Havamal teaches. Havamal 3. He hath need of fire who now is come, numbed with cold to the knee, food and clothing the wanderer craves, who has fared o'er the rimy fell. Okay? What does the Bible say? James chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Don't send them back out into the cold. Oh, come on in and visit a little bit and then just go out into the cold again. Hey, you know, may God, may the Lord bless you. You know, see ya. <laughs> no, you're supposed to help them. You're supposed to be a very hospitable person. And again, I do believe that that was a very big part of Viking culture, of uh, the ancient you know, Nordic people, say it that way, the Scandinavians, whatever you want to, you know, say there, the Northern Europeans, I do believe are very hospitable people. Uh, I don't believe, if you have watched the first study, I don't believe that the Vikings were these horrible, barbaric, just fighting all the time type of people. I think that's a lot of propaganda that came out because they fought against the Catholics that were trying to take over. I mean, what would happen if you fought against the Roman Catholics today? Let's say the the Catholics come to open power and they send around their inquisitors and they come here and I say, I'm not going along and I fight like crazy. What would the news media say about me? Oh, he's a, uh, some kind of terrorist and some kind of a white supremacist, xenophobic, you know, bigoted, you know, whatever. They'd lie about me. That's what they did about the Vikings in the past. Okay. Havamel 6. Let no man glory in the greatness of his mind, but rather keep watch o'er his wits. Cautious, cautious and silent, let him enter a dwelling. To the heedful comes seldom harm, for none can find a more faithful friend than the wealth of mother wit. Okay, what's the Bible say? The Holy Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18 through 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. How many people have we seen out there that think that they're really something? They think that they're really intelligent and, and I know everything and I'm this great learned whatever else. And then they mess their lives up. Ernest Hemingway committed suicide one of the greatest writers supposedly ever, and he committed suicide. Why? Hmm. Havamel 9. A little moose check there. <laughs> Havamel 9. Happy is he who hath in himself praise and wisdom in life. For oft doth a man ill counsel get when tis born in another's breast. Happy is he who hath in himself praise and wisdom in life. Okay. What does the Bible say? The Holy Scriptures, Proverbs 3, verse 13 and 14. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Interesting, almost word for word. The have a mill, almost word for word from what the Bible says. And the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. Hmm. Have a mill 26. Have a mall. Excuse me, I'm not, I'm, have a mill. No, it's have a mall. Pardon me. The unwise man thinks all to know while he sits in a sheltered nook, 
but he knows not one thing what he shall answer if men shall put him to proof. Okay, what do the Holy Scriptures say? The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Again, very similar. And you know, it's interesting. I'll say this before I continue. Um, there's a lot of debate about what did the original say and what was the intent and everything else of the Havamal. And it's the same thing with the Holy Scriptures. Uh, textual criticism. I found that to be very interesting as I studied this issue. Havamal 27. Um, for the unwise man, tis best to be mute when he come amid the crowd, for none is aware of his lack of wit if he wastes not too many words. For he who lacks wit shall never learn, though his words flow ne'er so fast. <laughs> Pretty good. Proverbs 17, verse 27 through 28. Look at the similarity here. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Hmm. Very similar. Have them all, 32. Oft, though their hearts lean towards one another, friends are divided at table, ever the source of strife twill be, that guest will anger guest. <laughs> I love that. I don't know any family that gets along perfectly when they get together. Family reunions almost always lead to some kind of a family fight or friction or whatever. You know, professing Christians, heathen, whatever. It's just, There's always going to be some kind of an issue. Um, what does the Bible say? The words of Jesus Christ. Let's read these. Matthew 10, verse 34 through 36. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Very true. <coughs> Excuse me. Have them all. Have them all. 54 and 55. Wise in measure let each man be, but let him not wax too wise. For never the happiest of men is he who knows much of many things. Wise in measure should each man be, but let him not wax too wise. Seldom a heart will sing with joy if the owner be all too wise. What does the Bible say? Ecclesiastes 1, verse 17 through 18, written by Solomon, King Solomon, um, who outside of Jesus Christ was probably the wisest man that ever lived, certainly the wealthiest and you know, had basically a 1,000 women, uh, 700 wives, I think it was, and 300 concubines. Um, not one night stands, but women that he could choose from. Uh, king of Israel after King David. It was King David's son. And he was the one that wrote Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 17. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Have you learned that in life? I mean, can you say, hey, that yeah, I, I would agree with the Bible on that. That is definitely true. You increase knowledge, you increase sorrow many times. You start to look into what's going on with the world and the economies and the, and the pollution and the crime and, and child trafficking and, and organized religion, the corruption of organized religion, and all of a sudden you start to get a little bit vexed, you know? You increase sorrow, don't you? Ecclesiastes 2, verse 15 through 16. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Never forget, back years ago, I was uh, went to this old historic place down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, where I was born and raised. My ancestors came there in 1714. Um, 
the Denklingers uh, from Bavaria. And I remember there was this old property and they had this beautiful old mill, all stone, you know, and everything. And, and had uh, they used to grind flour there and everything. And this older woman, I guess her husband had perished and he had died. And she just let the place fall apart. And there was a beautiful old barn. It was a timber frame, you know, post and beam, some people would say. Beautiful. I mean, just perfect joinery and everything. Built in the 1700s. I mean, amazing. And she let the, there was a hole in the roof and the water came in and it rotted part of the frame and the, and the barn fell, part of the barn fell down. And I remember I walked up to the wreckage and there was a, one of the tree nails there, the tree nails, the, the pegs that you use with your mortise and tenon joints. And I pulled it up out and I still have that peg in, uh, in my office. And I looked at that and I thought, that's very vexing. <laughs> Some master craftsman built this thing, you know, nearly 300 years ago, and some somebody just lets the place fall apart. It could stand for, you know, probably 1,000 years, but somebody let a, a hole in the roof and the rain got in and it rotted it. What was all the work for? Yeah, that wise man died just as much as a fool died. All are going to die. We all die. But when you get really wise and you start to understand a lot of things that's going on, you start to get a little bit just uh, increasing in sorrow. And you realize how corrupt this world is. Hmm. Havamal 59. He must rise be times who hath few to serve him and see to his work himself. Who sleeps at morning is hindered much to the keen is wealth half one. The Bible says, Proverbs 13, verse 4, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Sluggard, somebody that sleeps a lot, somebody that is lazy. Oh, I want this and I want that. Why don't you get up and work for it? <laughs> don't want to. Have them all, 73, first part of 73. Two are ho Two are host against one. The tongue is the head's bane. Whereas the tongue is a bad, you know, the worst part of the head. <laughs> James chapter 3 verses 5 through 8 says, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You look at some of the, the dictators of the 20th century, you know, Mao Zedong or Stalin or, of course, Hitler. A lot of people would think about that. How many millions of people lost their lives because of that tongue inside that man's head? Hmm. How many people died and went to hell down through the centuries because of the tongue of some pope and the priests and the bishops and the cardinals and the archbishops and all the a lot of people the tongue is a problem uh, that's why a, a man that can get control of his tongue that can get control of his speech uh, he'll do well he'll do a lot better have them all 112 i counsel thee stray singer Accept my counsels, they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them. They will work thy wheel if thou winst them. Thou shalt never sleep in the arms of a sorceress, lest she lock thy limbs. Hmm. Proverbs 2, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up, liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, the her there is uh, talking about wisdom, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Proverbs 2, verse 16 through 18. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger with, which flattereth with her words, which forsake the guide of her youth, and forget, forgetteth the covenant of her God. 
for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. Kind of like the sorceress there. The arms, you know, thou shalt never sleep in the arms of a sorceress, the Havamal says. Good advice. Uh, there are a lot of women out there that are very evil. And they're after your money and whatever else, and they will destroy you. I don't care what belief system you have. You could be an atheist or whatever. It doesn't matter. Heathen. Um, there are some women out there that are just no good. And they'll wreck a man. And the Havamal says it. And the Holy Scriptures say it. You have to be careful. Havamal 117. Wounded to death have I seen a man by the words of an evil woman. A lying tongue had bereft him of all of, of life and all without reason of right. What, is the, what do the Holy Scriptures say? Proverbs 7, 22 through 23. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. That passage in Proverbs 7 is talking about a young man that goes into basically an adulterous woman, a, a prostitute. You know, her husband goes away and she's earned a little bit of money on the side. Proverbs 6, verse 24 through 26. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. <laughs> wow. Um, I've seen that thing so many times. I've had, I've had people write me from all over the world. Uh, men write me and tell me of the, their woes that they've had from getting messed up with a woman like that. And um, men that had good lives and, and everything, and they met the wrong woman, and she destroyed them get to mess around with prostitutes and whatever else, it wrecks you. And again, it doesn't matter what your belief system is. That's just, this is good common sense, good advice. Havamel 134. I counsel thee, stray singer, accept my counsels. They will be thy boon if thou obeyest them. They will work thy wheel if thou winst them. Growl not, not at guests, uh, nor dry them from the gate. But show thyself gentle to the poor. And, and you know, this section of the Havamal here is actually supposed to be Odin writing. So, it's like the words of their... Odin is officially a god in the Norse, you know, system. But he's not god like Jesus is god. I'll explain that here in a couple minutes. But he's saying, you know, show thyself gentle to the poor. Well, what does the Bible say? Galatians 2 verse 10... Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So they had a council, essentially, in the New Testament there, the first century. And they said, you know, what should we do? What, what do we preach? What you know, do we go out? Well, here's what you do. But remember the poor. Go out and help the poor out. So, and it doesn't mean like the Catholic Church does, you know, go help yourself to the poor's money. You know? cry about the church needs your money and whatever else while the Pope's walking around with gold thread in his clothing and gold this and gold scepter and gold crown on his head and all these other things, you know, and, and please give your money to the church. And all of the daughters of the harlot there, again, you can read Revelation 17 and get the implication of that, but all the daughters of the harlot do the same thing. You know, give your tithes and offering here to the church. No scripture for that, by the way. Um, not many preachers will tell you that, okay? I will because I'm honest and I don't have a building that needs to be paid off. But uh, there's no 10% tithe in the New Testament at all for any reason. There are no church buildings in the New Testament for any reason. Hmm. And there's no single man pastor that's up there demanding a salary and whatever else. Serving the Lord is to, you know, people can of course give money to them that's fine you can you know if you're spending a huge amount of time preaching and teaching the word of god well it's perfectly fine to be paid for that but it's on a free will type of a, a situation it's not forced 10 percent tithe you know a lot of these pastors and churches they're making six figures a year over one hundred thousand dollars a year i know okay i've dealt with a lot of these guys i've preached in church buildings by the way i've been in 
behind pulpits and things that some of the great Baptist preachers preached behind. So I'm not ignorant, okay? Uh, I was a rising star in that, that movement for a little while, and then the Lord convicted me and actually read the Bible, and I realized, you know what? Uh, this, uh, what I'm doing here doesn't line up with the Scriptures. I want to follow the Scriptures and not man-made traditions. Havamel 137. I trow I hung, this is Odin writing here, I trow I hung on that windy tree nine whole days and nights, stabbed with a spear, offered to Odin, myself to mine own self given, high on that tree of which none hath heard from what roots it rises to heaven. All right. Now, you know, I don't know how people can't get the tie-in here that, you know, probably Snorri wrote combining what the scriptures teach with this Havamal. Uh, it's very plain, but uh, I'll show you what the scriptures say. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Calvary, the cross, it's made out of wood. Here referred to in Galatians 3.13 as a tree. Odin hung on a tree. What about the thing of... Uh, <clears throat> stabbed with a spear. We'll see about that here. Luke 23, verse 33, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Jesus died between two thieves. They executed him like he was a thief, which is interesting because the charge against Jesus was he made himself to be God. He didn't say, well, I'm created by God or I'm, a, I'm sort of a lesser God. No, he said, I am God. I am that I am. That's who Jesus Christ is. And again, just to explain the God of the Bible, it's not three separate persons like the Trinitarians teach. It is God, a being called God, and he has a body, a soul, and a spirit. All right? The body is Jesus Christ, the soul is God the Father, and the spirit is the Holy Spirit. All right? Those three, three separate, but they're one being. Right? And man is made after the similitude of God. I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. So do you. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And you know that there are certain things that your body wants to do and your, your flesh, your, you really lust after certain things. But there's something inside you that says, you've had enough to drink. Don't drink anymore. Uh, you probably don't want to mess with that woman. She's no good. Um, there's, there's something within you. Right? There's a soul there. Hmm. And you have a spirit as well. And that spirit can be influenced by certain things. You feel certain things. And it's not your normal, normal perception. You can just kind of feel, oh, there's something here. I don't really know what it is. We're spiritual beings, you see. We're made after the similitude of God. It's an important thing to understand. John 19, verse 33 through 34. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. They broke the legs of the two thieves. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Odin hanging on a tree, and he stabbed with a spear. It came after the Bible. This whole thing of the, the Havamal and Codex Regius and everything else, it came after the Scriptures. Don't tell me that they didn't copy it. John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18 Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. What did the Havamal say? Um, offered to Odin, myself to mine own self given. Huh. I lay, um, I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Look at this, verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. His soul is telling the body what to do. That thing that you feel there, different times. Something inside you, hey, you know, whatever. You're not supposed to do this. You shouldn't do that. Be careful. The soul of God, being the Father, says to the Son, you need to die on the cross. Why? Why on earth would he do that? Well, why did Odin do it? Odin died on the tree. Well, 
I guess he technically died. I'm not sure if he actually died or not, but he was on that tree, you know, speared in the side and whatever else. I would assume he died, but uh, he did it for wisdom. He did it literally for himself. You don't benefit at all other than just, well, the wisdom that Odin received while he was on the tree. Now we can be partakers in that wisdom. We can read the Havamal and have it. Oh, uh, that's kind of shaky ground there, friend. Um, but why did Jesus Christ lay his life down? No man took it from him. He wasn't powerless. He didn't just, you know, all oh, the Jews are accusing me of being God, and now they delivered me to the Romans to be crucified. Oh, oh, what do I do? You know, that's not Jesus Christ. Why did he die on the cross? Why was he punctured with a spear? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 6. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. After that he was seen of Cephas, Peter, in other words, then of the twelve. After that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. There were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ coming up from the dead. They saw him after his, he had been crucified and buried. He rose from the dead. Uh, not many other uh, gods can claim that one. Not many other heads of religion can claim that one. But uh, why did he die? He died for our sins. That's why he laid down his life, willingly laid down his life, because he knew we can't pay for our own sins. We can't be perfect. So God manifest in the flesh comes down and he says, I'm going to be born of a woman. I'm going to come into the, the womb of this young virgin named Mary and I'm going to take on a body of flesh. There was no intercourse or anything involved there. It's just God formed Jesus Christ in the, in the womb of Mary, the body there so that he could feel what it's like to go through what you and I go through. He could understand how we fall into sin. He could understand the temptations and the pain, the headaches, the sickness, the sorrow, the joy, the laughter. He wanted to experience it. God became man so that he could die. He could lay down his own life and say, I'm going to go through this life and I'm going to live without sin to offer myself as a perfect sacrifice. And if you'll come along and you'll take that sacrifice, I'll give you eternal life. I'll put my spirit in you. Your spirit that you have is basically, it's kind of like a radio without batteries. The Holy Spirit comes in and all of a sudden you start to understand things differently. You start to look at this world differently. Um, God saved me years ago. And if he hadn't saved me, I would have probably killed myself. Because I was trying all sorts of things to, to just for thrills and whatever. And uh, life was pretty miserable. Not on the outside. I looked really happy and looked really like I was going places. I had a Corvette. I had a fast motorcycle and whatever I wanted. And, uh, but the reality of it was I was miserable. The Hollywood movies, uh, The Escape from My, my Reality... Um, with movies and, and things. What good is this? Uh, relationships and things. Good relationships, bad relationships. The sorrow of, of truly being in love with a girl and then she leaves you and whatever else. I went through it. What is there? What's the point? What's the point of life? Uh, well, uh, Odin, he died on the tree there to, to get wisdom. And what good is his wisdom doing me? Oh, and uh, at the end of the Havamal, there's a bunch of spells that you can cast in through here and things and different, you know, what does it get into? You know, you will find runes and read the staves, strong magic and spells set down by the sage that the gods made the wisdom of Odin. There, Havamal 141, and you get in all these 145. I know a spell, no king's wife can speak. Spell casting. Some snow falling off the tree there. I thought, <laughs> uh, I thought the moose was behind me. Um, 
Spell casting. For what? What good is that? Does it work? Well, not all the time. Yeah. Well, I know something that does work all the time. The Word of God. Um, you can have a personal relationship with God. And uh, you can come out here. That's why I preach out here. Preaching out here in the woods. Uh, could I build a church building? Yeah. Could I get control of people and have them come and uh, call me the great preacher and whatever else? I had it in the past. Um, I don't want that. Uh, I could have had a really big church at one point in time. Church building. Could have, you know, become a, a big name. I, I don't want it. I don't want it at all. Um, you'll experience more about God out here and His creation. And think about that. You can come out here and you can, you can uh, appreciate what God made or you can go into some place, get a mortgage, build some big building, you know, wood, stone, whatever, and say, I'm going to worship God in here. I'll worship God in a place that we built with our hands rather than coming out here and worshiping God out here in a place that He built. <laughs> um, you say, what about this sin thing? I don't, I, I, I'm with you except for the sin thing. I don't really like that. Um, well, understand what the Bible says about sin. Sin are those things that you do that you know you shouldn't do, okay? You get drunk a little bit too much. You, you mess around, you know, having sex outside of marriage and whatever else, bad relationships and things. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things. You steal something. You, you're just a total jerk to somebody. We all have those issues. We all have sin in our life. There's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. You know, there's none that sinneth not. We all sin, all right? And all the Lord's trying to do is He's just simply saying, hey, I created you, and I'd like you to come to me and be with me in heaven someday. Fight my wars for me, okay? Uh, it's a good soldier of Jesus Christ down here on the earth. I want you to go out there and, and stand up for me and be bold for me. Preach my word to people. Tell people the truth. You know, it, it frustrates me because I've seen, I've seen some, some men that really will take stands for the truth, and yet they're not saved. And then I see men that profess to be saved, Christians, in other words, and they wouldn't stand for the truth if their life depended on it. That's always been a mystery to me, always been very frustrating to me. And I just think, <laughs> how does that work out? Come to the Lord and just say, yeah, okay, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I mean, you don't have to be down on your face, bawling and crying and whatever else. I mean, you get to that point that you really screw your life up that bad. Well, okay. But just come, yeah, God, I'm a sinner. And I reject all this man-made religion stuff out there, all the Catholicism and everything else. I want to know truth. I want to stand for truth. I want to be bold for you. And then when you watch the next study, you're actually going to see the difference between Valhalla, Volhol, it's the proper way of saying it, and heaven from the King James Bible. And um, we're going to be doing an interesting study on that. Uh, if you think that Bible-believing Christianity is some effeminate religion, well, you're talking about the stuff that goes on in church buildings. You're not talking about what goes on in here. I mean, just get a King James Bible. Don't mess with the new ones, the, the, the New American Standard Version, the English Standard Version, the NIV, whatever. They're all ones that come out of the Vatican. All right? I get into a big study on that. You can watch some of my videos on that if you have more questions. But this book right here, this authorized version, originally called the authorized version, later on it became nicknamed the King James Version because King James I of England, uh, the 6th of Scotland, um, back there in the 1600s, early 1600s, he authorized the translation of this great book right here. And it was called the authorized version. Then people called it the King James Version, and it kind of stuck. So, but get a book. Get one of these. Uh, it's a great. I mean, you can buy some really beautiful editions of this authorized version here, the King James Version. Get a copy of it. Read it. You know, see what, see what it's all about. Um, you say, well, I, I guess maybe I should uh, get saved. I should probably come there to you and, and uh, confess my sins to you and whatever. Don't even waste your time 
you don't need to come here. You don't need to come meet me in, in person and whatever else. And I have to go, you know, submit myself to the Reverend Holy Father, you know, Brian Dunlinger or something. No, you don't. You can get right, right there, right where you live. You can call out to God. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. James chapter one. I lack wisdom. Hey God, I want to know the truth. I want to see the difference between what goes on in this book and what goes on in the churches out there. Because I don't like that effeminate church building stuff. I don't want anything to do with that. I want to know the truth. Yeah, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And the Bible says if, the, if this book, what it says about you is true, that you died for sinners, then that means you died for me. I'd like to go to heaven when I die. I'm willing to step out, step forward and boldly say, okay, God, I'll be a soldier for you. I'll let you command me and tell me what to do. And to the best of my abilities, I'll fight battles for you. I'll die for you if I have to. I mean, how do we know for sure that some of these Vikings weren't saved? How do we know? Oh, they were all Christ-hating God, rejecting pagans and whatever. Do we really know that? Can we really trust the Roman Catholic sources that write those things? The same Roman Catholics that condemned the Waldensians of northern Italy, that fought, took up sword and fought against the Roman Catholic system? Can we really trust the Roman Catholics that talk about Protestants like the Calvinists and things and the Puritans that fought you know, against Roman Catholicism? What do the Catholics say about Oliver Cromwell? I mean, do you realize Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England in about 16, the mid-1600s, a little while after this book was written, um, he waged war against King Charles I. They cut off King Charles' head. He was beheaded because he was a traitor. King James, of the King James Version, he passed a law that no future king or queen of England could be a Roman Catholic. And so what does his son do? King Charles I goes out and he marries a French princess who's a Roman Catholic. Totally disobeying the law that his father had just passed. And he's going and he's, he's going to join basically and get Catholic forces in to fight against his own people, against the English people. And God raises up Oliver Cromwell and a bunch of other Puritans and they go to war. And uh, yeah, the Battle of Naseby and all these great wars and things where the Lord delivered uh, the king into Oliver Cromwell's hands. They execute the king, rightfully so, and Oliver Cromwell takes up the position of Lord Protector. Saved man. I mean, how does that work out with the modern Christians, the modern effeminate little sissies that go to these church buildings and, can I give you a hug? You know, <laughs> disgusting. That's why it's ironic because Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, um, the Lord actually writes and says, I will spew thee out of my mouth about the people in the end times that profess to be Christians. They make him sick. He wants to vomit when he sees them. And if you're a red-blooded man and you've seen these church-building people, you know what I'm talking about. They're disgusting. They make you sick. Effeminate little sissy men. <laughs> but uh, Oliver Cromwell, he dies. His son Richard takes over in his place. And King Charles II is in exile, the son of King Charles I. He comes back, deposes Richard, comes back to power. And what does he do? Digs up Oliver Cromwell's dead body and chops the head off of the dead body and then takes his head and sticks it on top of, I think it was Westminster Cathedral. And it was there, I think, up until the 1800s. And you talk to a Catholic about Oliver Cromwell, they'll just, they'll just go livid. They'll just go crazy. Red face and just, oh, I hate that guy. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing. What they say about the Vikings, that they were such horrible heathen people. Well, that's the same thing that they said about Oliver Cromwell and many other great men of God that fought, that took up arms against the Roman Catholic Church. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, you know, there's some things, of course, in the Havamal that uh, I would disagree with very much so. But uh, I didn't even go over all of the different um, things, different parts of this Havamal. But there's a lot that lines up with this blessed book right here. Um, 
You do what you want. It's your life. You have free will. I'm not going to come to your house and forcibly convert you to do anything. Um, but I recommend you study this book. Get a copy of it. So I thank you very much for your time. And uh, we will be doing the next study will be Valhalla versus Heaven. And you will be shocked at what the Bible promises for redeemed saints when we get up there to be with Jesus Christ. Um, just give you a little hint. There's war up there. There's fighting up there. So much for the uh, little sitting around on clouds playing little harps and little wingy people, friendly, nice. No, it's fake. Um, ironically, uh, the Valhol is actually, I would say, probably less violent than the reality of the future for a Christian. Tune into the next study. And uh, again, thank you for watching this one. And we'll see you. Please take heed. Please get a King James Bible. Okay, here's the moose tracks of the moose. I was talking about at the beginning of the video, just in case you don't believe me. There it goes this way. And down through the woods. Right down through there. And uh, where I was speaking. That is right over, excuse me. Right over about here is where I was standing, so pretty close by.